anybody else joins, we'll just let them in. But thanks for coming back for part two of phone prospecting. This is going to wrap up the class. Hopefully we still got um, quite a bit to go through, a couple more sections. But um, before we do that, I kind of wanted to recap a little bit for those of you who weren't here. So um, phone prospecting in general is just one of the toughest things that we do in real estate. So um, it's tough because mainly because an agent will lack confidence or not have a very good mindset going in. So um, the goal is to you know change your thoughts and your mindsets and also provide information that you can take to help boost your confidence. So when you're faced with another phone prospecting day, you don't just dread it the whole time. You actually look forward to the opportunity that it gives you. So let's just do a quick recap of some things from section one, because that's where we stopped um, the class last time. So becoming successful at phone prospecting is very similar to with most aspirations that you have. Um, you must understand what to expect and where to begin with phone prospecting. Your role is to get them to meet with you and to form relationships overall. You must learn how to do it and with what systems or tools um, to do it with. So make sure that you're using some that support you and also don't cost a lot of money. Um, I know that we talked about like Spokio being a really great app that you can um, use to get like personal information like phone numbers or email addresses. Um, and also be sure that to check out some different apps that will send you straight to voicemail, for example. Um, because when you get sent to voicemail, that kind of creates a cold call into a lukewarm call because they'll have to call you back. Um, and we talked a little bit about that in part one. Also, be sure to double check any numbers that you're using on the do not call list um, just to avoid any penalties or anything. Um, and obviously, the fine line there is that's just straight cold calling. Like if you get a lead or or something like that. That's not something that you necessarily have to double check, but um, just use your best judgment on that. And then finally, call scripts are just a start. They must sound like you and be shaped to who you are. So don't be afraid to change those up. You don't want to like go through them. I know we were getting some laughs last time about some of the scripts and the wording. Um, I know that they can be a little a little bit more structured than what we would typically say. So take them and make them your own. Um, and then just role play and practice. That's probably the most critical part because the more that you do this, the better that you're gonna get. So now we're gonna get into section two, which is best practices and um, best practices to improve phone prospecting. So let's do this. So in this section, there are six steps to success. So that'd be goal setting, environment and calling station, prospecting call rituals, numbers tracking, performance standards, and accountability. So before we dive deeper into each of these, does anyone remember kind of what the mantra was to this class? I just said it. Hmm. The more that you do it, the better that you're gonna get. And then does anybody remember kind of our two key words? No. Confidence and action are two key words for this class because it's two key things that you're going to have to do to be successful with phone prospecting. So let's get into these. So the first one, goal setting. So setting goals of your phone prospecting will increase the probability of your success. So. Did you know that when you write a goal down, it increases that goal, like the goal's odds by 50%. So be sure that you are setting goals with phone prospecting and that you're writing those goals down. Every time you talk with a prospect, you should have four, four big goals or questions that you want answered. So each are designed to make you be more or be or bring more value to the clients that you're working with. And those four are, are they a potential client today? If no, are they a potential near-term client? Um, if no, do they know anyone that can become your client? And then the last one, can you be their go-to agent in real estate? So you're trying to identify one of these four questions when you're talking to any potential client going forward. And some other great ideas or tips for your prospecting goals. Um, contacts and conversations. So each time before prospecting, you should set a goal for the number of contacts or conversations you want to have that day. So calculate how many prospects you need to 
contact in order to lock down a buyer or seller or a listing appointment. Um, veteran agents, you guys will, um, you know, kind of suggest the beginners start with five contra contacts per day or one secured lead per day um, or one listing appointment per week. Those are just kind of some figures that producers use. Um, and then of of course that varies by market and brokerage too so early on it's recommended to start with a conver conversative goal so as you become more proficient your goals can transform from that goal and, and stretch into bigger goals and the numbers that you track over time you'll start being able to to calculate how many that you need to do to generate um the next one is emails another goal is to always try and obtain email addresses so you want to maintain contact with them through either a monthly email campaign or whatever your follow-up program might be. Um, this will keep you in that top of mind position, which is the position that you always want to have with your clients because anytime a real estate need comes up, they you want to be the person that pops in their head. So think about that email addresses. And then lastly, celebrate. So this is a big one. Um, and I think that we need to talk about it too, because as we talked about before, prospecting is hard sometimes. So each win should be recognized and celebrated. So setting goals is a great step towards recognition of each accomplishment that you are trying to do for a larger goal. So inspire yourself by just celebrating your wins. It'll help you stay driven and inspire others to reach bigger goals as well. So any questions about that? So now let's chat about environment and calling station. So this success is linked back to mindset more than anything. The idea here is to enhance your mood and energy levels, which will result in a better outcome or long-term results. So the environment <clears throat> important um, right now, is your environment quiet? Are there lots of distractions? Are you able to get your head in the game? You want to think about all these things, not just about prospecting. So, um, but each each day you should be working on your environment or trying to at least be mindful of it. Um, some other things to think about, maybe some upbeat music. Having low volume and upbeat music playing while prospecting allows for your energy to be really high, ultimately helping with your tone and approach with each call. <laughs> You also want clean and fresh. So you want to make sure that your workspace is clean and it's fresh. Adding like maybe a small plant or opening a window or using a candle, um, maybe some special decor. Those can all help keep you positive and help make you positive too. And then calling station, keep it simple and limit distractions. So a phone and a computer are probably the most essential items for you to have. So put your cell phone face down and on silent so you don't get distracted with notifications or other temptations. Yes. If you are using your cell phone to, as like your primary phone, set a goal to not hop between apps maybe, or maybe reward yourself with an extra couple of like app minutes after you've got all your calls done. So that way you're not just like doing a call and then you're scrolling through Facebook for 45 minutes and then you do another call. Just try to set a goal for yourself like that to avoid it and that way you just get all your calls knocked out at once. You also want to schedule breaks. So your body and mind need like a down second. I'm sure like we all do, um, especially with different systems and processes in real estate. So working in shorter interval intervals such as 20 or 30 minutes and then taking maybe a five to 10 minute break before returning will increase your energy and improve your mindset. So take a break between a call or a couple of calls, use this to shake off anything that you need to or jump right back into a great mindset or positivity. So that's especially if you're knocking out tons of calls at once. But if you're like me, when I do calls, I like to break my calls up. So like, say I have a goal of maybe 25 calls a week, like I'll break that down and do five calls a day, for example, Monday through Friday. Um, and to me, just keeping it smaller like that, it doesn't seem like so much of a chore at the end of the day. And you can also have that mindset where it's like, oh, I only got to make five. I can do that. Like five's easy. So maybe you're a little bit more like me and you need to kind of space them out that way in order for you to be effective with it. 
And then posture and positioning. So standing is highly encouraged and allows for better interaction. Sitting or bending or hunching restricts your diaphragm and it kind of impacts your tonality. Sorry, Jen. Hey, Jen. So, anyway, that kind of impacts your tonality and, uh, and restricts your diaphragm, like I was saying. So, standing and moving around during breaks is also recommended, also, because it'll re energize you as well. So, don't be afraid that if you take a break to just get up and kind of move around for a minute. Any questions on environment or calling station? Cool. So now we're gonna take some action with you guys. So are people still coming in. So on page 24, and if you don't have your book in front of you, that's fine. But um, I want you to kind of think about or identify two or three changes that you could make to your workspace right now that would maybe enhance your ability for phone prospecting. So take a couple minutes, think about them, and then I'm going to ask what you guys kind of came up with. Hey, they can't see me, can they? Can they yeah, see me? They see you. <laughs> you can't see me. Caught me. <laughs> it's not Halloween yet. Take off the mask. <laughs> Sorry, you guys are so serious. I had to come in and I heard it going on. So appreciate Hello. it. Hi. Good morning, guys. <laughs> okay, guys. So give me some that you thought about. So, what are some changes that you may want to make to your workspace right now? A do not disturb sign. Ooh, that's a good one. A really good one. Anybody else? Have it be clean. Clean, yep. That helps me for sure. For sure. Does anybody like really love their workspace? Do they get a lot of positivity out of it now? Jen, I see your office, it looks super cute. Just <laughs> some stuff to think about guys. So again, kind of look around. Um, I know some people that I've talked to, some agents, like they like to have maybe like an inspiring quote picture of some kind on their wall or something like that. So it can even be something small just to give you a little boost of motivation. But those are all great ideas. So now we're going to talk about rituals. So having some prospecting rituals will help prepare you um, and your mindset and your body before you even make calls. So before you call, try this like 20 minute warm up. So create your positive energy. So stand up, move your body around, smile, um, maybe recite some positive things to yourself um, and tell yourself that you're going to be successful. So that's the next one. You know, just recite positive affirmations, believe in yourself, tell yourself that when you call people that you're going to get the results that you want. You also want to review your personal value proposition. So, you know, why they should choose you. Maybe it's uh, you have so many cells in a particular area or other relevant stats or information, but just keep thinking about why they should pick you over a different agent and believe in that as well. And then you can also rehearse your scripts aloud for 10 minutes. Um, the key again is to sound natural here. So just kind of reciting them to yourself will help. Uh, and maybe even having them in front of you and maybe you need it like an order. So you have what you're going to say when they answer the phone to maybe your objections list over here. So you know where to hop and skip around, whatever helps you. And then lastly, visualize successful conversations and outcomes for five minutes. So think to yourself, take some time and just be like, you know what? I know this is hard, but I'm going to nail this call. I'm going to nail this call because I'm an awesome agent and I can, I can do this. I mean, just little things like that, whatever works for you. That's what works for me, but I'm cheesy like that. So then you're going to get into the during the call session. So energy is absolutely key here. So you want to stand when making calls. So invest in maybe a cordless, cordless headset or wireless earbuds too, if you're working off of your uh, desk phone. You want to remain confident, relaxed, and genuine. So don't sound desperate, stiff, or phony. Um, don't give up too soon. So allow yourself to build a rhythm here. Like experience kind of that caller's high. 
Um, once you get maybe a yes, you'll just be like super pumped, super jazzed. So remember what that feels like and kind of put yourself in that mentality. Um, and then finally, just stay hydrated. Your brain is kind of 80% water anyway. So the more that you drink, not only are you hydrating yourself, but it gives you the opportunity to pause or maybe slow down too in a conversation. And then you remember, you're gonna keep doing better with all of this stuff each time. Like eventually you're gonna, you guys are gonna get so good with phone prospecting that you're not gonna need scripts in front of you. But you may, you know, now if you're, especially if you're a new agent and you've never done it before, you're gonna need tools and stuff. But over time you're gonna start alleviating and it's gonna become more of a structured flow or process. Then after the call, so you made the call, maybe it was good, maybe it was bad, but after the call, you need to remember the five R's. So review, recognize, rehearse, release, and regenerate. So you're going to review the call, maybe rate the call on a scale of one to 10. Maybe that would be helpful for you. You're going to recognize the learning lesson. So maybe think about what would have made that call a 10 plus or 10 plus plus or just better in general. Um, you're going to rehearse out loud again, maybe practice a more effective response or a more effective script that you wish you would have used or something. Um, and then you're just going to release the outcome, good or bad. You're just, you know, that was just one call on to the next. I'm not going to let anything from that call get me down for this next call. So just release and let it go. And then lastly, regenerate your attitude. So move to the next call with more confidence. You're going to do better next time, or I'm going to change this up and it's going to land me that yes. And then remember to make your calls behind closed doors so that you can totally focus, less distractions. Gene, that's a great idea with the sign. I'd even maybe make it funny. Like, don't bother me right now. I'm prospecting or something, you know. Um, but just be totally focused on what's vital at hand. So you're just trying to knock out your calls and you're trying to generate those yes responses. So now we're going to talk about tracking. So it's important to track your work so that you can figure out over time if it's working or not. So over time, you're get, like I said, you're going to get to a point where you're going to feel or you're going to know how many contacts to make just to generate um, so many numbers of closings or so many listing appointments, whatever that number might be for you. But you're gonna eventually get there the more that you do this. So when you think about how you wanna track your prospecting, consider the following matrix or metrics. So um, these will kind of help you uh, track basically your attempts, some, some key things of those calls. So you can do total dials, calls per listing, set rate, uh, listing, um, listing appointments is what that means, total talks that it took or total sets that you had for the month or week or whatever that might be. Um, and then also consider some post prospecting matrix to track too. So once you've made a successful appointment, it's important to track the progress from that point on as well. So like consider a show up rate, a conversion rate, maybe your average gross commission, total meetings, total close, and total incomes. Because again, when you look back over your year or maybe your quarter, you can see how many um, you know calls it took to generate a listing appointment, how many calls it took to convert it, um, you know what your income was, things like that. And the more that you can systematically approach this and be really detailed about it, the more it's going to help you when it comes to end of year business planning or or maybe even your 1099. I mean, it can go all the way down to that level. So, you know, don't be afraid to get pretty detailed with it. And then tracking time frame. So it's important to track each of these metrics over time, like I said, to understand their effectiveness. But um, you want to make sure that you're consistently doing it. And every time you engage in pro phone prospecting, you can track this um, and, and get all of that data, like I was saying at the very end. So this is just kind of um, an example that shows up in a lot of our books. It's just kind of the financial consequence. And you can kind of do this, too, to get it in your mind. But essentially, you're just creating the financial consequence page um, yourself. And that's just showing you how you can move through each phase, phase one being maybe where a newer agent would be. 
to phase two, just bumping up those listings or those calls, and then phase three, which is kind of that unlimited level. That's where you want to be to generate more income. So every agent's going to go through this. I don't know an agent that does it, that transitions from phase one to phase three. But if you kind of put numbers to it, you're going to see how the more calls that you make, the more that it's going to pay off for you. And then these are to calculate key performance standards within your business. So when tracking these within your strategies, consider some of the key conversion rates shown here. Um, and it's kind of similar to what we talked about in that other tracking slide. So, you know, dials per talk, talks per set, um, meetings per listing appointments. You can get creative and do exactly whatever you want as far as what you want to track. But I would definitely consider these if you have nothing in place or you're not tracking anything. I would definitely beef it up for yourself. Um, I even like the meetings per car ride also because, you know, that's that's a statistic that not a lot of people think about. So another great tool for monthly listing accountability or one for buying accountability too um, is this one up here on the screen. This just makes these work to the best of its ability. So utilizing this with a partner maybe um, for more accountability, uh, report your actions to this person. If you're going to have an account accountability partner, kind of do this each week, maybe each month, whatever works for your schedule, but you're just holding yourself accountable to your goals. So I would say that accountability is the single biggest differentiator between successful and unsuccessful people is, you know, you have goals, you're going to hold yourself accountable to those goals and nothing's going to swing you from that. And I think that more people in our market should definitely have that mentality. Like I'm going to do so many calls a week and this is exactly what I'm going to do and nothing's going to get in the way of that. And that's how phone prospecting should be treated. You can also use this to track calls um, received from yard signs, maybe home ads or websites, because those are all important too. And you can apply each definition on the from the right cell over to this blank, um, blank tracking calendar. So write your numbers down per day and total them at the end. And then you kind of get whatever you did for the week as well. So these are all in your book. Don't be afraid to use them, create them, make them your own. You can do it in Excel. I know mine's in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, some people use a lot of apps or tools online, but just make sure that you're tracking things because it is really important for your accountability or your business. So let's do another fun thing. So um, let's review the previous tracking sheets that we were just looking with. Um, and you guys tell me, discuss what you think is best to use or any observations that you had from what you saw. So what are you guys using? Are you guys using anything cool? Doing anything different? Not using anything? <laughs> I'm kidding guys. Just be creative, we'll keep going. <clears throat> I'm not using anything right now. But. Okay. Thank you for your honesty. And and definitely definitely Google search. I mean, there's a ton of different options. I know I don't have to tell you guys that, but start tracking. So section two wrap up. So as with many objectives or desires to succeed, it starts with goal setting, followed by the data from tracking your results. And then setting your goal is a good start. However, it like to successfully follow up, you know, tracking does make all the difference. So remember to create a suitable and comfortable working environment. This will ensure that you'll be energized and go the long way into creating the right mindset or acting or being effective in general. So preparing or properly preparing for a call, just make sure that you're going to, that just helps you win in the, in, at the end of the day. So Let's do it. So leveraging the existing numbers or tracking tools that are provided in this section are for your benefit. So find an accountability partner to share your progress with. And this is not for them. It's for you at the end of the day. It's to keep you accountable to your goals. Any questions about section two? Cool. Got one more section, section three. 
So this is advanced phone prospecting skills. So for the majority of real estate agents, the largest obstacle to building the business they desire is that it lacks consistency when it comes to prospecting. So every call not made is an opportunity lost. That's what we need to think about. This ultimately results in a widening of the gap between you, your goals and achieving those goals. So it is crucial to build consistent habits um, into your prospecting plan. The ultimate goal is to make it automatic, a uh, reflex, if you will. Um, this section will cover how to review some proven methods for making that goal kind of more of a reality for you. So again, there's five steps to success within this section. So scheduling, handling objections, checking of your attitude, becoming your best, and then looking forward. So once you've kind of mastered these five that I just said, you may be ready to kind of take your phone prospecting skills to a new level. And in this section, sorry guys, in this section, um, we really talk about these advanced skills as it pertains to expireds or FISBOs, um, as well as just concepts of building a long-term referral database. Um, and that's all through phone prospecting efforts. So with enough phone prospecting in your tool belt, you will have the experience to introduce these two new lead sources into your calling plans if you have not done so already. Um, and then th they can prove to be pretty lucrative sources too, if you're not afraid of just kind of going on more of this advanced level. So let's dig deeper with these. So first is scheduling. So if you don't have time for phone prospecting on your calendar today, schedule it anyway. You must be proactive and schedule it for making calls. So to successfully create a pipeline of clients, you must prospect every day. You must think of it as being just as important as having a listing appointment or getting an appointment. If you don't schedule your call time, you'll find that it won't happen consistently or at all. Um, so commitment is kind of key here and therefore you need to be clear with your schedule and just make it happen and evaluate what you do each day to try to do a better job the next day. And you may be asking yourself, you know, what are some good times to prospect? And that's the next thing. So when is a good time to call a prospect? Honestly, there is no perfect time of the day or day of the week to make prospecting calls. But just being thoughtful about when you call or who you're calling about, um, will they'll pro probably improve your odds for success. So being prepared before making your call is more important than when you call. Your first key to success is just putting your prospect first. So this means that when you call them, you better have something important to say. You know, very few people like interruptions to their day. So when calling, be sure to deliver the right message with clarity, basically. And then just be mindful of the prospect before choosing a time to call them. You know, put yourself in their shoes for a minute. You know, think to yourself, what time of day would be the busiest for them? What time of day would they most likely be available? And then actual time of the day to call, you know, it's just an important aspect of phone prospecting is knowing when to call. There are certain times of the day that are most effective to make dials statistically we found, but on the flip side, certain times of the day are also ineffective. So it's recommended by all of our research and, and, the, and the agents that give us this information for Momentum. They recommend a call between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. in the morning or from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the evening. Would you guys kind of agree with those times? Do you have any times that work a little bit better? I don't know, five to six? Yeah, five to six is what they I recommend. Think, I think a meal time. Yeah, yeah, I think meal time. I also think more more so than meal, I think Apparently. more about just people getting off work in general. Right. Well, so. Yeah, anytime after four is getting off of work. But it's, that's a tough time in the afternoon. Four to seven is a, is a tough is a tough period. Yeah, I would agree with that, Gene. Thanks for. Thanks. You have to do it sometimes. You know, yeah, you have, you have to, do, to it. do it sometimes. Even if you have to leave a message and hopefully get them, or uh, mm -hmm. Saturdays have them get back to you. What did you say, Kyle? Oh, I just said Saturdays are good. Because, Saturdays are good. Yeah. yeah. I didn't yeah. think about the weekend, um, you know, Saturday or Sunday. 
yeah, Saturdays are good. Sundays, I haven't had much luck. It's yeah. probably because I like really don't want to do it on Sunday anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. That's football day. So yeah, so that's good input though, because maybe that's more just specific to our market. So if you guys, you know, play around with it in, in your days and the time frames, figure out what you know generates you the most outcome. But I would definitely try Saturdays. Kyle has a lot of experience with something like this with phone prospecting. So maybe Saturdays is kind of the key. I think nine to five, nine to five, <laughs> anywhere in that area right there. Either if they're working, then at least you can make a connection to talk to them later. Yep. Uh, if they're not working, you know, they can take a little time out of their day to talk with you. So uh, after that, it's like, you know, family time after 5 p.m., like I said, dinner or whatever, um, sporting events with kids if they have them. Mm -hmm. And anytime before 9 o'clock, uh, it's just a little too early, I think. Got to let the, like you say, got to have the first couple cups of coffee in you to right. get, the, get the brain working. Yeah, I know. I definitely need my coffee. So, All right. So next we're going to talk about handling objections. So remember that people will follow, trust and follow what you can logically and tangibly explain, which is so true. So most realtors want dialogue that cures problems that they've created, but the smarter approach is actually to internalize dialogue that prevents common problems or objections from ever occurring in the first place. So we talk about these in our objection class as well, but some things you can do to prevent objections from occurring is the following. So you can allow sellers to self-discover. So be the leader, the constant education provider, bringing things of value or information. Allow them to take that path. Um, next, become a strategist. So just be logical. Um, treat your business like a business and present yourself professionally and just, you know, Keep hitting them with facts, whatever those those might be. Um, track your results, which you know I pretty well hounded you guys on this section. So track your results, be accountable to yourself, um, improve your results. So be intentional. So if something's not working, make sure that you're fixing it, whatever that might be, whether that be a script or or how you're handling voicemail, whatever. Change it up if it's not working. And then lastly, cause your results. So be proactive. You know, a lot of it comes up in the form of an excuse. And since we've known that and we talk about it a lot in this class, don't allow yourself to make any excuses. I mean, I know that's hard because I can't tell you how many times I'm faced with picking up my phone to call somebody and I'm just like, God, I really just don't want to do this. But that's an excuse. And it's, you know, it should be unacceptable to your business because that's not generating money for you. And then clients work with those they know, like, and trust. That's also a fact. So be likable. Make sure that they know you so you're top of mind and make sure that they can trust you. You know, talk about confidentiality. Talk about how you, you know, they can rely on you, that you're there for them through whatever process that they might have a need for because um, those are really impactful. And then more on handling objections. So typical agents work on overcoming objections. However, successful agents work on preventing them from happening. We, we said that before on the last slide. So now you may wonder, how do you make them more effective? And here are some common dispositions that you should have. So um, you should be confident, maybe open to suggestion, aware, unique is always a good one. Um, because you always want to show that you're going to be different from the competition. So however that difference, like whatever to you that might be, make sure that you're displaying it. You're going to provide them a unique experience. Um, all, honest is also a good one. Maybe approachable. I mean, I can't tell you how many times um, in a lot of our classes I talk about how if you take some time to maybe understand different personalities or you take some time to match their tone or what their um, communication style might be. Like they could be a really fast talker. They could be a really slow talker, things like that. So being more aware of all of those things are only going to make you more approachable because you're going to be trying to give them the same interaction that they're giving you. I've seen a lot of success with it. 
Um, and then finally, just some more, you know, intentional, focused, passionate. Those are all good things that you need to incorporate in your mindset or make sure that you're displaying. And then finally, above all else, sellers are attracted to professionals they believe can get them results. So make sure you're demonstrating that you possess the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to get the job done just in general. And I'll go back to that unique thing. I think that the more that you can uniquely separate yourself, the better job that you're gonna have. So who in here rates like their doctors, lawyers, accountants? Is anybody big into giving reviews? Nobody gives reviews? Come on guys, a one Amazon review? I don't believe it, I don't. <laughs> anyway. The point is, if y'all did reviews, is you got to kind of hold yourself to those same standards. You know, people are looking at you. They're watching you even when you're not even expecting it. So think of that. You know, how would you rate other professionals in your life, whether that be your doctor, lawyer, whoever, people are doing that with you as their professional. I think it's really important to talk about. So let's look and practice some scripts. So... Having scripts available, again, is not the be end end all, um, but they're good for facing common objections from prospects and they'll help you become a better prospector as well. So memorizing them and every scenario can be hard. Um, so these are here in your book on pages 34 through 36 are the scripts that they have. Um, and they can help you, like I said, in times of objections. And the more that you do this, remember, the more you're going to get away from it too. You're going to get like the same objection over and over again, that you're not, not going to need that script in front of you for very long. So remember to take them, make them your own. And I wanted to practice them with you guys. So we won't go through all of them, but I want to hear somebody give me something for, well, how did you get my number? How'd you find my number? You're gonna make me pick on people. This is why you guys don't like me. <laughs> who, who are you calling? Anybody that'll give me anything. Because if you find it online, then it's like, you know, like with a, anybody that's put their cell phone number out there, mm -hmm. you know, then you just tell them where you got it. But, and I haven't done any of the like, grab the yellow pages and just call people. Right, right. Um, have you ever had this one, Kyle? Have you ever had anybody just like, how did you get my number? Uh, yeah, one, one time when I tried calling a neighbor who, uh, like the next door neighbors wanted to buy the house. Mm -hmm. And I just basically just said, Hey, on the internet, you can find just about anything you want with enough effort. And, uh, and then asked him if he didn't was interested. And then that was it. They didn't push me any harder. Well, that's a pretty good thing to say, you know, with the internet being the way that it is or, you know, whatever, I can pretty much find everybody. I mean, not, I'm sure you delivered it way better than I just did. That sounded creepy coming from me, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go with somebody else on this next one. I'm just going to sell it myself. So what I typically say in that situation is, you know, if you go with a real estate agent, you have a little bit more exposure to all the agents that are in the MLS and we can, you know, market to all of our different areas. We've got our Facebook, we've got our Twitter, we've got, um, you know, all different things that we can market a little bit better than just doing your typical for sale by homeowner. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bringing information to this one is the key. I would also um, consider depending on the situation, you know, if, if they come at you and they're like, well, I'm just going to sell it myself. You can use it as a way to really outline the real estate process of selling and just be like, okay, well, are you making sure that, you know, your disclosures are filled out properly? Are you making sure that, you know, you're getting your inspection or appraisal? I mean, just anything as far as educating them down that road is only going to help you at the end of the day, because 
they're going to pick you when they realize that they can't do it themselves. If that makes Especially sense. with those uh, lakefront homes, because a lot of people aren't knowing, you know, they've got to get up on the AMRA permits and the dock Absolutely. inspections and all of that. That's where, you know, that kind of shines too. Yep. And I, I agree, Kayla, like, especially if it's a lakefront home or a condo or something, I'd be throwing stuff like that. If, if I ever got that objection, you know, what are you going to do about your, your, you know, dock or, or Amarin or just anything? I would definitely do that. All right. Next one. Will you lower your commission? I want to pay 6%. So I haven't had this question before, but I know I hear Mel say all the time, she goes, if you're willing to cut your commission right up front, what are you willing to cut during the whole entire process? Mm, that's a so good one. if she's going to cut her commission, then, you know, she's not going to work the best to get you the full amount of money for your actual property. Yep. It's a good one. I also think about like kind of what Jason says about how he's like, well, something along the lines of like, well, if you're focused on commission, basically you're focusing on the wrong thing because I'll actually probably have more money in your pocket, even paying my six or 7% commission. I don't know exactly the, the exact wording, but it's something along those lines. Yeah. All right. Last one. You are the 12th agent that called me. So mad right now. Why do you think calling me? The last of the dirty dozen. <laughs> Come on, safe space. If you can't do it with me on a meets call, you can't do it on the phone. So what is it that turns you away from the other agents? Ooh, answering it back off the script with another question. Um, I don't know, Gene. They just won't leave me alone. They constantly call me. They want to know if I'm going to sell my house. Just if you want to sell your house, uh, they don't ask any other information? No. I mean, they just want to know. And then if I don't talk to them or I just hang up because I'm just so frustrated, they're like the 12th person. What is the reason you're selling your home? I'm selling it because my mom's in Michigan and I want to be closer to my mom. But I really so, have a hard time with real estate agents. Why do you have a hard time with real estate agents? Because I feel like they just can't do the job better than what I can do the job. I mean, I can probably sell my home better, don't you think? Well, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> So I got to work on my scripts a little bit. No, it's okay. I'm probably being really extra mean. Well, there are many, uh, many things we can do for you. The marketing, there's a lot of time involved and I'm sure you're busy. And then you also got the worry about getting back to your mother. So we take all of that off your shoulders. We do the marketing, we do the paperwork. We make sure that everything is done on time so that your property gets sold and that there aren't any issues with it. Um, yes, we'll be calling you. Yes, we'll be asking you questions, but it's to make sure that everything is in order to get the process done in the right amount of time. Awesome. Awesome response. Okay. Give me some observations. Like, did anybody get anything that somebody said from a script that they thought was really good? Any suggestions on anything that could be possibly better? There's so many different scripts out there. I mean, you can... There is. You there can is. download them from here, or there, and the other place. And you just, like you said, you just got to have to, you kind of have to make them your own. They all, they're mm -hmm. all basically getting to the same point. And you just take little pieces of each one. And like I said, I keep them right, I keep them right off to the side. So if I get in a bind and I get that, uh, uh, I can look over real quick and it kind of clicks. And then mm -hmm. I can finish out. One thing that I found, um, that has helped me take scripts and make them is like I kind of copy and paste from Adobe or, or whatever the source is and I'll put it in like a Word document or something 
And then I'll just kind of retype it underneath what I, where I copied. I'll just kind of retype it as more of a way that I would say it or, or that I think the wording would be just better with. So I'll retype it and just depending on how I deliver it, um, maybe that's over a phone call, just have it up in front of me. The other thing that I do is I found a, um, a uh, what's it called? Um, a teleprompter app on my phone. So I can take those scripts and I can basically use this teleprompter app. It'll record you so you can do a video or a bomb bomb or something. And I found that that just really helps because it gives me time to really think about the scripts. And like I say, or like I said, tailor them a little bit and then just get creative about sending them out. So you guys can do a lot of the similar things. You can find your own, um, find your own you know, Google ones or or whatever works for you. But those are just some tips that I personally have had some luck with. You know that when we had that luxury home one, that, mm -hmm. that Cohen hit on it. He just said he he practiced it so much. He just took so much time. He practiced so much. He had an answer for everything they came at him with. Yeah. And he had his partner, his wife or whoever ask the hard questions. Mm -hmm. And he was prepared to have those answered. And when he went into his presentations, he was bam, bam, bam. But I mean, well, that's so, that's so good. Cause it just reaffirms that point, Gene, of just, you know, the more that you practice, the more you're going to memorize it just in general. So let's go on to checking your attitude. So step three, again, um, I won't go into too much detail cause we harp on it a lot in a lot of these classes, but the best way to check your attitude um, or this process is just to look at, you know, our core beliefs, pay attention to the bold ones because they really apply to this particular class. Um, also, if you guys haven't seen them, I just wanted to be able to point out that we made um, like these core beliefs into signs too. So like we have several at the main office and several here at Camdenton. So they're out there too. If you guys are ever like walking over to the main or whatever, you can see them there if you can't find them in a book. So we do have them kind of within both of our main offices. Um, and, you know, they also came from the pros. Like these came from actual agents out there over time that were just like, you know what? Beliefs would really start changing my mindset. And that's a, a lot of these as well. So. So next is just becoming your best. And the way to do that is to obviously spar, which is study, practice, action, and reinforce. And we talk about that a lot. So becoming a pro, like I said, takes a lot of time and a lot of situations that you learn from rather than do right the first time. So the next thing is that you all, again, probably think it's really cheesy. And I totally get that. Um, like I said, the scripts are a little structured. Uh, for my taste. But if you're wanting to be better at this process overall, um, you know, you just got to start by, by sparring. You just got to practice. You just got to keep trying and keep trying. And that's the only way that you're going to get better with it. Um, I will say though, that if you are wanting to better your phone prospecting skills in general, you know, I just dare you to try some of it. I mean, I just dare you to take one script from this class or, or maybe that's um, a tracking sheet, just anything. If you're not doing anything currently, tr take a couple bits and pieces or takeaways from these classes and start trying. Um, because again, that's the only way that you're gonna know if it's gonna be effective or not. So um, I found this cool video. I know that in the book, it talks about a different video, but it's not out yet. So I found this other really cool one and I'm not exactly sure if it's gonna let me play it or not, or if you guys can hear it, but we're gonna try. So. How would you like to help local businesses and get compensated very well mm. all without ever leaving your own home? Can you guys hear it? Yes. So I want you guys to watch this video and then afterwards, we're just going to kind of talk about, you know, your thoughts on it, basically. Get you guys back over here so I can see you. <laughs> You see it? What's up, everybody? This is Brian Casella, BC. Welcome to another video. I hope you enjoyed the last video of a surprising errand with Lamborghini. That was really cool. 
I really enjoyed making that video, and it was cool to see his reaction. Anyways, how to nail oh, nice. the first 30 seconds of your cold call. Now, the first 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds are the most crucial. We know that because the majority of people get frozen, get nervous, or get shut down in the very beginning portions of a cold call. I want to give you some very basic and simple tips just to help you out to maybe not get you to 100% success rate, but get you closest to 100% as possible. Remember, there's no tried all true way that's going to get you 100% success all the time. That's just not possible. Okay? So, in the beginning of a cold call, what a lot of you do is the mistake that you make is you don't mirror and match people right away. If somebody speaks very quickly and says, hello, who's this? You want to speak quickly. Say, hello, this is Brian. Okay? The biggest thing that I see is somebody will misstep there. Okay? Now, mirror and match, I mean you literally copy them. Their tone, their pace, their volume, as much as possible. Okay? That breeds an air of familiarity and now takes them farther away from this is a cold caller to maybe I know this person. Okay? Now, if I'm calling somebody where I know the name, like let's say it's John, if a male answers the phone, I'm going to say, hey, John. If he says, hey, hello, I'm going to say, hello, John. Almost assumptively saying like, yeah, John, that's you. That gets him to, to now say, wait, okay, wait, who's this? Instead of saying, hello, this is Brian, I'm looking for John, which is how a typical sales call will go, right? You know the difference, you see the difference now. That may not be John. I'm going to say, okay, cool. Can you pass the phone to John? This is Brian. Again, even if I introduce myself, I'm going to say it assumptively. Because if I call and it's not John, hey, pass the phone to John. This is Brian. You know how many times I've said that and they just pass the phone and they're like, uh, I hear John. He's like, wait, who is that? Like, I don't know. But since I did it assumptively, the guy doesn't ask me, who is this? Inches. Every time, but you get what I'm saying. It's all about how you do it. So, I want to eliminate the feeling of sales and ignite the feeling of we might know this person. Okay. From there, when you introduce yourself, a lot of people will say, how are you, or something like that. Stop doing that, right? They know you don't give a shit. I know you don't give a shit. You're just doing that because you feel it's like the polite, right thing to do. It's socially acceptable. Throw that out the window. Okay. Everybody else is doing that. One of the biggest tips I can give you is stop doing. Stop doing what other people are doing. The majority, stop. Okay? You drop that, you get right to the point. If you're going to ask anything in the beginning, say, do you have a minute? Or you got a second? Okay? Because then that's being respectful of their time. That's the one thing you can ask that now is genuine. Okay? Don't say, how are you, and all that other stuff. Do you have to ask that? No. Sometimes I get right into it. Every once in a while, I'll ask if I hear kids in the background or some kind of distraction. I'll acknowledge it and say, hey, I hear kids in the background. I hear a lot of you know commotion in the background. So go out and call you back. And they'll say most of the time, no, it's cool. Just make it quick. Perfect. Next, after you introduce yourself, it's Brian with Keller Williams Real Estate Company or whoever it is that you're calling from. Okay, You let them know, I'm only going to be a second. I'm only going to be a minute. I just have a few quick questions. Okay? By saying this, you answer their initial question whether this is in person or over the phone, which is, how long is this guy gonna to try to keep me on the phone? Okay. Now, usually at this point, you're already near 30 seconds or you're at 15 or 20 seconds. Now your first line, get right to it. Oh, hey, I'm calling because, the reason I'm calling is because, boom. Make it straight to the point. It shows that you're respectful of their time. They're more likely to stay on the phone with you and they're a lot more likely to answer, okay? These are just some very quick tips for the first 20, 30 seconds of the call, okay? Now I'm gonna make another video. What'd you guys think? Some pretty good tips. Yeah. Some things that I didn't even think very were there that I thought very. were pretty good. So like I said, I just wanted to share that with you guys. I'll have more videos and, and stuff too in the classroom. But the biggest point that I liked that he made um, was do something that no one else is doing. Like, just forget everything and do something else. And I thought that that was kind of good. <laughs> so, just for fun. <laughs> so finally, just to wrap this up, looking forward, 
So here are some additional tips for these groups or ideas. So expireds, the key with these is to is speed. So try to be the first to connect with this source because the more that you put it off, the more other agents are gonna try to annoy them. So try to make it the first group that you try to call. Um, FISBOs, this group is the now business. So with FISBOs, it's usually always comes down to commission, right? So eventually, um, the seller will give up and hire someone after realizing that they can't do it themselves. But this requires just you constantly following up and a lot of patience. It takes you being there for them and not offering to sell anything for them that eventually gets you to sell. So best practice for FISBOs is to check in like on Mondays. Uh, monetizing lead sources. So over time, you're going to start to realize where you know your leads are working and where they're not. So this allows you to just um, understand where to spend, like to spend the majority of your call time with. So it's worth saying that because you need to be sure that you're using your time effectively. And then just building your database. So the overall end goal is for you to build your database bigger um, with past clients that will eventually render more clients or give you more business um, in the future. So when you get to this point, most of your phone prospecting will be to former clients. And that means that you've reached the goal and you don't have you know, to do as much phone prospecting. So make sure that you make detailed notes so that you can always have tons of information to interact with your clients on, whether that be a son's basketball game or whatever, just be really detailed with your notes. So to wrap up section three, um, skills are built in flow and perfected over time. Learn your skill and then seek to master it before you move on to the next skill. Uh, phone prospecting, like any other skill, takes time to develop and action to master. Figure out what sources you're working with and what's working for you. And remember to schedule time and to make it automatic. Objections are best handled through rehearsed practice and scripts and a positive attitude with a focus on core beliefs. That will be a, a vital tool for you guys on getting positive results. So remember to study, practice, act, and reinforce and be consistent um, and just follow the material. And if you guys need anything or you're thinking about different ideas, reach out to me too and we can brainstorm on how to get creative with maybe some of these scripts or reaching out to people in general. So any questions? No, oh, ma'am. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. If you need anything, reach out to me. Keep practicing. Bye, everyone.